One online is uh, from Sheila Page of the ODI, which is a question either for uh, the ambassador or for Dr. Mez Egrier. What is the size of the three times one program compared to total government spending in Mexico? This would determine if the bias of those not the poorest matters. Perhaps you'd like to also ask your question. So that's the first question. Thanks. My name is Shobha Das. I'm from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees Office, working on a special initiative on Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted uh, to, to see if someone, perhaps you, Rachel, could reflect on the nature of remittances and development in conflict and post-conflict situations, where I think there's a whole set of challenges, which is massive, and there are lots of institutional and security barriers in the way of fulfilling um, mechanisms. And my other question was about whether there's any work I think mm -hmm. I'm going to limit you to one question, actually, <laughs> because there are, there are, there are, we've got ten minutes and there are four. There are four it's connected. It's about refugees, which I think then. is a diaspora in waiting. And I just wondered if there's anybody doing any work on refugees and remittances. Okay. Or somewhere in the chain. Okay. There's, there's a woman there. And there was a somebody else. There was a lady there in the, yeah, in the, one there in the black. Hello. My name is Frida Wusu, and I've just um, completed a PhD in remittances. Um, uh, from a sender's perspective. <coughs> My question really, um, uh, perhaps to their excellencies, is what their governments are doing for the diaspora right here in the UK, um, and whether uh, they consider the, the precarious nature uh, of the livelihoods of some of the people in the diaspora, and whether their banks are able to help them, for instance, with financial inclusion. There was somebody else over the back there uh, had their hand up. I can't. See, uh, that, that. Yes, go ahead. Um, Melanie Archer, Africa Research Institute. Um, we've just heard from Rachel and also from Dominic Thorncroft um, earlier about the importance of banks changing their perception of risk. Now, I would think that this would require sort of very, fairly high-level commitment from a senior government minister, and also just sort of joined up working between. DFID as well as the Treasury and other agencies. And I was just hoping that Rachel could sort of elaborate on what DFID is doing to bring this up as high up the food chain as possible. Thanks. Okay. Rachel, maybe you'd like to take that point first specifically about... Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is um, pretty high up the food chain. There is significant interest in this issue in the, the UK government at the moment. I think the um, what specifically is being done on risk in this new working group, and of course Dominic might have views on this and um, Dahab Shil of course will have views as well and they're part of the work but what's being done on that I mean there are two pieces to it one is strengthening guidance for the MSBs on how to comply with their anti-money laundering and terrorism financing obligations and um, that's very important in itself but it's also important that the banks know and see that guidance and know that it exists and that the regulators are, are involved in developing it um, is one part of the, the risk piece. Um, the other one is um, more explicit. There's, a, there's three strands of work in this working group, and one of the strands is a specific piece on risk management. You can see that on the website, um, but it is working to bring together um, the law enforcement, the trade associations, and the bank representatives to um, look at and unpack the actual risk um, facing the banking sector. And I think many of those points have been made earlier about the importance of um, differentiating the actual risk and looking at the information that we have in front of us about the risk faced by different sizes of MSBs. Okay. Uh, Minister Councillor, maybe you'd like to take that point about what, what are you actually doing to help the diaspora in the UK? The, the Frido's point, we should ask what, 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 are you, what are you actually doing to help people in, from Ethiopia working here or living here in the UK? <coughs> yeah, uh, yes, we are working here, uh, di uh, diaspora, for us we have to try to make them aware of uh, uh, the policy uh, and the guidelines which the government had already formulated uh, in order to encourage the diaspora to take part uh, uh, in the development uh, effort of the country. So w w we are trying to get one in one, or we are trying to get those also. There are a lot of Ethiopians here who are organized as hometown association or as, as in, in knowledge and technology transfer as a diaspora in different aspects. We are trying to work to, to liaison with them and trying to, to give them you know, updated information 
and uh, we are also uh, serving as, as a liaison, as a bridge between the diaspora association, diaspora here, and the government institutions back at home. We are encouraging them to go and to invest in Ethiopia. We are encouraging them and giving them the benef what benefits they can acquire if they go to Ethiopia, invest in Ethiopia, to, if they go to Ethiopia uh, uh, and open the diaspora account, which I've already explained, if they go to Ethiopia and they try to contribute in knowledge and technology transfer in, in the higher education, they can go and uh, teach for one week. They can go and uh, teach for a month or even one, uh, to share their experience for one day and so on. So we are doing a lot of work and that is why uh, what we are doing now. Okay, excellent. Ambassador, maybe you'd like to take the point from Sheila Page about uh, how does the size of the three times one program compare to total government spending? Well, I did. And I maybe, mean, you'd like, maybe you'd like to also yeah. respond to, to, to some, of yeah. the, some of the points that Cova made because yeah. it, I know time's running out. So, thank uh, you. And I, and I will come, yeah. come to your point in, 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 a, in a second. Well, thank you. But I just want to uh, add uh, on what um, uh, the Ethiopian government is doing. Uh, we don't have a big diaspora over here, so we don't really have anything. I mean, we, we have around. 9,000 Mexicans live in the UK, and uh, none of them are, are economic migrants. So, But we do a lot in the United States, where we have this population between 33 and 40 million. And one of the things that we've done better to actually allow them to be part of the financial system is providing them with IDs, the IDs that we produce at our consulates, and that we've negotiated with different states in the United States so that they are valid for them to go to a bank and open a bank account. This is just an example of how you know, like, uh, we engage with the local population in different parts of the United States to make them uh, facilitate for them to be a part of the financial system. Going back to the question online, uh, there's no point in comparing uh, the annual budget for this year for the three times one program is $42 million. That's not even 0.001% of the government expenditure every year. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, really, and, and that going back to what Gordon uh, was saying, I mean, the real purpose, well, number one, and uh, you have to go and check the, the rules of uh, operation of the program uh, as of this year, because the program actually is operating in the poorest of uh, municipalities linked to communities in the U.S. As, as of this year, that's you know, the re new rules of operation. And uh, of course, it's, I mean, it's not even, a, uh, going back to the question online, um, there's no point in comparing two, two, the two things because this program itself is not aiming at changing anything that the government itself needs to do. I mean, the government expenditure of, of Mexico uh, just last month was pretty much two, uh, $2, billion, $2 billion for that month, which is, I don't know the percentage, but you might know, get 200% more of what the yearly budget for the three times one program is. But the, the importance of the three times one program is that you know, it engages... Um, diaspora organizations, it engages them with, well, one, one, I mean, engages them with the rest of the organizations in the U.S. and engages them with the local communities back in Mexico. It's not something that intends to provide uh, something, it doesn't, it, it really doesn't uh, aim at uh, supplanting what the government needs to do at other levels. What, so what, do, you, what do you say about the two points that Cover made, which was the one that it's, it's not, it's going to some middle ranking rather than poor, to poor, poor regions. And uh, secondly, well, secondly just, there's, yeah. a, there's a degree of political bias here. What, what's, what's, what's your well, point? Well, number one, that it's uh, not correct. The, maybe the, the study is from a couple of years ago. Uh, if you go to the rules of operation as of the year, the program specifically is acting only in the poorest of uh, municipalities in, in Mexico. I mean, if you look at the rank of uh, the, 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 the less, uh, less economic uh, uh, economically developed uh, municipalities, that's exactly where the program operates. And uh, when it comes to political bias, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's, a, I mean, the important thing here, and I do believe, is that the, why, why it engages so much diaspora organizations, that why they are, are so eager to be a part of it, is that actually it gives them a way of uh, fiscalizing the whole process and of accountability to a certain degree, that they are part of the decision-making process. Uh, and they are there in order to to vote and to say whether this is good or not. So I do believe that, that of course, there's political bias in, 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 in certain parts of the process, maybe, because you know, a certain yeah. party has different uh, um, different programs, different, uh, well, different political platforms. And the, between the diaspora itself, there are allegiances to different political parties. But leaving that aside, what's important about the program is that it's, uh, it's something that the migrant organization wants to keep alive, and they, they really are engaged uh, with that, and uh, they do believe it's a good way of 
uh, fiscalizing the, the, the money they send to Mexico. And they do believe there's accountability about, uh, about the whole program. Okay. okay. Do you want to quick, very quickly, because I, I would like to take the question about, um, about post-conflict. Yeah, moments. yeah, yeah. Just, just very quickly, I'm glad that the rules of operation have changed. Um, as I was mentioning, our study was from 2002 to 2007. Uh, we did a, consult, a consultancy for the Secretary of Social Development specifically mentioned that, so I'm, I'm happy that uh, this actually had, had some value uh, and, and the rules of, of, of operation have been, have been revised. I'm nonetheless surprised uh, about how the powerful uh, federations and the powerful uh, migrant organizations, uh, how and why they have, uh, let's let's say, tolerated this, this change in the in the rules of operation that clearly benefited them. Uh, just uh, as as Ambassador Gomez was was mentioning, really the program is very small in absolute terms. Uh, collective remittances, which are the remittances that hometown associations uh, raise, are about one percent of private remittances. So it's actually very very small money, but uh, what is interesting is that despite the fact that in absolute terms uh, the, the money is small, in, in terms of what it may represent for municipalities, it's actually a pretty big uh, amount. So in terms of the budget for the municipalities, the amount is, is, is much more juicy than the absolute number uh, may invite uh, to think. Okay, so. good. Uh, Rachel, maybe you'd like to take the point about remittances and uh, development in post-conflict countries. I know the UK is particularly concerned about post-conflict countries, one area that DFID has really been quite... You know, yes, quite yeah. I, I mean, I would make a couple of points. I mean, one is just a sort of general point I've been thinking about during the course of today, which is we know a lot about remittances uh, as inward flows, and they are inward flows by definition. I think one of the things that we're thinking about in relation to conflict and fragile states is that we know a lot less about outflows. Um, and I think particularly in relation to, we, we know that remittance flows into many fragile states are playing an essential role mm -hmm. in terms of supporting economic activity and investment activity. But we know less about the, if you like, the return that people are, are these remittances that are being put into essential capital investments, we know a lot less about the outflows. And so there's a sort of, there is a big data gap um, in conflict and fragile states as remittances get turned into equity and investment. What's, to what extent is that staying in the country? So I think we've, we've definitely got a set of questions about understanding the, the data and maybe that's something we can talk about with ODI that we don't know. I think in terms of the, um, the, the points about the, the keeping the costs down, recognizing the role that remittances play. We've spoken about that a lot this morning, and I think that remains essential. And I think the slides we saw from ODI, I think you could probably portion that up by fragile and less fragile states and see that it's the fragile states that are bearing these very, very high remittance costs. And I think that's a challenge to us to really concentrate on those, which is why we have been concentrating on Somalia. But I think from this morning, I feel challenged to take away, a, you know, more of a focus on the high cost and fragile states. I don't know what the answer is on refugees and remittances. I, I think that's also a fair challenge. I tend to think of refugees on the whole as UNHCR supported refugees from very, very fragile livelihoods and positions and haven't perhaps thought about those as people with surplus flows um, to send back. But I think I don't know, I think it's a set of good questions for us to Okay, good questions uh, to which we'll muse and mm -hmm. ponder over the answers. I'm afraid that is the uh, end of this session. The ambassador has to go, so thank you very much, ambassador, for, for coming and giving that presentation. Thanks also to all the other three members of the panel. Thank you to you two for turning up, and there is a reception now. I hope you stay in for it afterwards. Um, I'm here, I'm still there, but not from coming to leave, but I'm not from ODI, but from coming to leave. I'm here. Kevin's gone off for an interview, but I just wanted to thank all of you, and Larry, and, and Glenis, and all the other panelists for coming today and giving a wonderful uh, set of presentations. And to all of you uh, to, for being over here.
um, I hope this debate will continue, and I and I'm, I'm also hopeful that in June there will be a conference on African action, and we will have a session on on remittances. So I hope we'll see many of you over there. But there is a reception outside, and so do stay on and have a drink with me. Thank you. Thank you.